A narrow fellow in the grass is one of Dickinson's poems which shows a vivid portrayal and intense observation of the natural world. Dickinson um, was very interested in examining and researching the world around her. In a letter to Thomas Wentworth, she wrote that the supernatural is only the natural disclosed. So a sense that there is revelation all around us. If we simply hone our senses, we can find that insight, we can find something uh, beyond, something a bit supernatural beyond the natural world around us. And when she says that the supernatural is only the natural disclosed, disclosed has a sense of um, examination to us, that we have to examine the natural world to perceive something um, greater, something supernatural through it. This poem in particular shows a curious fascination with a snake. There is a sense of delight and familiarity which Dickinson portrays with the poem, familiarity with the snake. However, uh, lurking under the surface of the poem is also a sense of anxiety. The snake is ominous and the poem moves structurally. If we think about the development of the poem, the poem moves to... Um, a climactic intensity, a chill or a fear, and a sense that perhaps we will never really know the um, the, the nature of, of the snake. It, it challenges the romantic movement's idea that we can have a communion with nature. The poem is told through a male voice, and um, in the middle of the poem we can... Um, hear the memories of a childhood, ex a childhood experience of the speaker. Ultimately, I think the poem uh, is Dickinson questioning our ability to really understand nature and whether or not we can have a communion with nature. Dickinson begins the first stanza with a playful tone. The use of internal rhyme with narrow fellow, which would have um, created quite a comic internal rhyme with a New England accent, suggests a, a sense of fun, a sense of childishness at the start of the poem. Certainly we find later that um, this is a male speaker who's remembering um, a childhood experience of, of seeing snakes in the grass. Um, and so the poem perhaps undermines or um, subverts our expectations of how a snake um, would perhaps conventionally be portrayed as something terrifying and scary and, and, and sinful, whereas the word fellow creates a sense of cordiality, um, a friendliness, a sense of friendship perhaps between the speaker and the snake, suggesting some sort of mutual um, mutuality between nature and humans. The conversational tone that is created by the colloquial word fellow is continued in the third line. You may have met him, did you not? Now Dickinson does not actually use a question mark here. I just put it in to um, emphasise that kind of question, drawing the reader in to the intense observation of the snake, asking the reader to share or, or to ver verify the fascination um, and the experience of, of seeing the snake. Um, and again, there's a childishness in the grammatical inaccuracy of, of did you not? You may have met him, have you not? Um, so it's quite playful, it's quite fun, get a sense of childish voice, perhaps a sense of naivety or, or innocence about the perception of the snake. Perhaps it is only our adult perceptions that um, understand snakes in, in a stereotypical, uh, sinful, evil way. Now, the last line of this stanza is particularly interesting. His notice sudden is. Here we have ambiguous syntax. Whose notice is sudden? Is it the snake who suddenly notices us? Or is it uh, we as humans that suddenly notice the snake? There's a blurring here. The, the pronoun him is, or, or sorry, his, the pronoun his is ambiguous. Um, perhaps this suggests an affinity between the, the snake and humans. Syntactically, we're being blurred, we're being drawn together within this line. Humans and nature are, are being um, drawn together. 
or perhaps there's a sense of, of, of mutual shock at each other, that perhaps maybe we cannot truly be at one with each other, that nature and humans um, cannot have this sense of mutuality. The notice is sudden. Perhaps this suggests a shock, something frightful. Perhaps Dickinson is suggesting that there will always be something unknowable or unexpected about nature and we will continually be surprised by what we see. The delightful familiarity that we get with the word fellow at the start of this stanza is perhaps slightly undermined by perhaps the shock of the snake sharply observing humans as well as humans sharply observing snakes. The final thing to say is that this stanza uses a lot of sibilance. Grass occasionally rides, um, notice his sudden is, and this continues into the next stanza. And this is used to reflect the hissing snake-like qualities, but also perhaps to suggest something a little bit more sinister. The second stanza develops the intense observation of the snake. The speaker observes the colour um, and its texture, it's a spotted shaft, as well as its motion and movement, the, with the simile that it, um, it divides as with a comb. And the anaphora, the and, and, as well as this temporal adverb, then, suggests a minute moment-by-moment uh, -moment observation of the snake's nature. The metaphor that Dickinson uses to describe the snake as a spotted shaft is incredibly interesting. Shaft here, this noun, is often associated with light. You often have a shaft of light. Now light for Dickinson is a very ambiguous contradictory concept. If we think about her poem, A Certain Slant of Light, the light on the one hand is something perhaps symbolic of God. If we think about the lexus of Christianity, light often represents the, the light of God. And um, this light, however, although heavenly, also creates hurt. She uses that, that oxymoron, heavenly hurt, in a certain slant of light. So this contradictory nature of, of, of light perhaps can be seen with the connotations of shaft, perhaps like the snake. There is something um, divine about the snake, you know, her, her intense observation of nature. She can see the divinity, that the super, perhaps the supernatural, something, something um, wondrous in nature, but also... The, the the scary and terrifying aspect to nature, a bit like the heavenly hurt that we have of the light. So perhaps the shaft reminds us, that connotation of shaft and light reminds us of Dickinson's contradictory ideas about light, which we could then um, transfer to the idea of the snake. However, shaft is also um, used to uh, represent, for example, a shaft of an arrow or the shaft of a sword. Um or a spear, perhaps. And again, that suggests the danger lurking with this snake. And we get a sense of danger as well with this verb, it closes at your feet. This suggests something sinister, things closing so that they're obscured to us. And this um, suggests that Dickinson is emphasising the elusive nature of the snake, um, something mysterious, unknowable about nature, and that we cannot easily perceive the full um, wonder of nature, that communion and observation with nature cannot be easily achieved. It takes time. The final comment I would like to make about this stanza is Dickinson's use of the passive tense. A spotted shaft is seen. Now this is in the passive tense here because there is no subject actively doing that verb. There's no one seeing. We don't know who sees a spotted shaft. A spotted shaft is seen. There is no subject doing that verb. And so we can say that it is in the passive tense. And perhaps Dickinson has purposely chosen this tense in order to generalise about the experience of seeing 
the snake that this isn't a very, simply a personal um, a personal exploration of the snake that this is a universal experience that we all have when confronted with nature this stanza continues the sharp observation and insight into the nature of the snake the snake likes a boggy acre suggesting the alien and different nature of the snake to us and a floor too cool for corn again suggesting its difference um, to us and the poem now starts to focus on a recollection of when the speaker was a boy. But when a boy in Barefoot, I more than once at noon. And we're starting to understand who the speaker is. We know that the speaker is a male because he's recollecting something from his youth, a boy and barefoot. Now, this description of him as a boy in barefoot, does it emphasise his childlike innocence, this portrayal of the snake and, and his close to the snake, closeness to the snake, um, does that portray his innocence in the way that when we're younger we can perceive the goodness in the nature around us and perhaps it's only adult perceptions that see the danger. So um, we associate snakes typically with, with um, evil, their venom is poisonous and dangerous and this poem very much... Um, on the surface at least, emphasises an amity, a cordiality with the snake. Um, especially, you know, the snake likes a boggy acre. He's, the, the, the voice is humanising the snake, suggesting this natural affinity that we might have. So does it suggest this childlike innocence? Or is Dickinson's emphasis on, on, on barefoot, does that suggest the vulnerability um, and therefore highlight the implicit danger of snakes to humans? that humans and nature cannot have that communion or affinity. Now, it's very interesting um, what happened to the metre of this poem. So far, we've had rather regular common metre. This means that um, the stanzas have been constructed of a line of iambic tetrameter, followed by a line of iambic trimeter, followed by a line of iambic tetrameter, followed by a line of iambic trimeter. Now, this happens in the stanza, so we've got tetrameter, trimeter, tetrameter, trimeter. However, on the tetrameter lines, we are missing the line's final stressed beat of the I am. So here and here, we're missing that final stressed beat of the iambic uh, foot. So he likes a boggy acre, and then there should be another stressed foot here. He likes a boggy acre and then we're missing that final stressed foot it's not there we've got one two three and a half that foot here is missing so we call this a feminine ending when it ends on a weak beat an unstressed beat we've got that unstressed beat here and the same happens here but when a boy and barefoot we're expecting a stressed beat to come, and it doesn't come barefoot, and, and, it, and it's missing. So we have two feminine endings here. And as the poem continues, there are more feminine endings to come. Now, is this because Dickinson is suggesting, again, that vulnerability? There's some shifting expectations here of the snake. Perhaps it isn't as friendly as first understood. Um, so the unease of this feminine ending, the instability in the line, suggesting that unease, reflecting the idea that the boy is vulnerable and the boy is in an uneasy position with his bare feet. It is interesting that Dickinson adopts a male voice for this poem. Perhaps this is a comment or on the restriction of females, the idea that females could run freely through the grass without being watched or without being accompanied um, means that she had to imaginatively adopt the, 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 the persona of, of a boy to, to wishfully imagine herself into that situation. And perhaps this poem is a comment on the restriction of um, females in um, Amherst. This stanza continues narrating the speaker's childhood memory and we find out what it is that has happened more than once at noon. 
Um, the speaker says that he has passed, I thought, a whiplash and braiding in the sun. Now, this is clearly a case of mistaken perception. It is not a whiplash that he saw, but it is in fact the snake. And Dickinson here is implying that humans are perhaps unable to truly understand nature, that our perceptions are not sharp enough or quick enough to really understand the nature of what is around us. And that our, our senses have to be honed to gain the insight. I refer back to what she wrote in the letter to Thomas Wentworth, the supernatural is only the natural disclosed. We have to really truly hone our senses to find what is disclosed in nature. And um, she, or, or the speaker, he, thinks that he saw a whiplash. Um, perhaps we here have a sense of, of danger of the snake, a description of a lash something um, dangerous and um, the idea that it's unbraiding in the sun, unravelling to suggest the movement of the snake and unbraiding is a very interesting word to use, use unravelling because in fact this poem unravels our own perception of the snake. Um, we are not really sure what to think. Is it dangerous? Does it suggest some sort of evil to the snake? Is it, um, does, does nature make humans vulnerable? Or is there an amity? Is there a sense of friendliness that humans can have with snakes? Um, now, the speaker stoops to secure it. And this is very intriguing. It suggests humans trying to control nature. Humans trying to, um, be perhaps imperial over nature. And this raises the question, is the snake evil in itself? Or, or does evil come from nature? Or does evil come from us, from humans? What is the nature of evil? Who is evil in this poem? Snakes are often associated with evil, but actually the actions of humans here suggest something a little bit more sinister than perhaps the snake that is just weaving in and out of the grass. Um, and the snake certainly eludes humans. It wrinkled and was gone. And the finality of, of the verbs was gone suggests that it is highly elusive. It um, is outside of our grasp, both physically, but also in terms of perception. It is greater than perhaps our human insights. And what about this verb here? It wrinkled. What does that suggest? Something that wrinkles is perhaps a bit grotesque, horrifying. It wrinkled is that just a sharp and um, curious um, description of the movement of it? Is this wrinkled something fascinating or something grotesque? Um, now here in this stanza we also have some feminine, feminine endings. Um, on the um, first and third line, I have, I have passed, I thought, a uh, whip, lash, and we're missing that final strong beat in that final I am. So it ends on what we call a weak beat, which makes it a feminine ending, and that is the same in list this line here as well. So that iambic tetrameter line is missing its final strong beat in the final I am. And does that suggest an unease about the nature of the snake? Does it, the instability of these lines, suggest an unstable shifting perception of nature? We can't really understand it. Furthermore, the rhyme in the stanza is very interesting. We have not had any rhymes so far. However, in this stanza, we have what is very typical of Dickinson, a uh, slant rhyme with sun and gone. Slant rhyme is half rhyme, rhymes that don't fully um, resonate. So sun and gone. And perhaps we can suggest that there are similar reasons for slant rhyme as there is for the feminine endings. A suggest of something um, uneasy, something that you know, this, this, this rhyme isn't complete, suggesting perhaps our incomplete understanding of nature. 
In this stanza, we can again see a sense of um, amity, mutuality, affinity with nature. The speaker says that several of nature's people I know, and they know me, suggesting a friendship or, or an understanding of the nature of each other. The noun phrase, uh, several of nature's people, is quite an interesting um, way of describing the animals of nature, nature's people. Um, is this quite a childlike understanding of the world around us? Or again, does it suggest that actually nature and human are, humans are, are closer than, than we realise? Does it actually suggest this closeness um, with, that exists within the world? The speaker says, I feel for them a transport of cordiality. Now, transport is a very interesting word to use. Um, a transport is often used to describe a, a great spiritual experience of joy or rapture, um, suggesting the wonder of the world around us, aligning nature to the divine, um, quite a, a transcendental idea that Dickinson is adopting here, here, or perhaps a romantic idea that the divine is per perceive you can perceive the divine in the nature in nature around us. Um, perhaps there is also um, a pun here that I feel a transport of cordiality. Cord reminds us of the um, mistaken perception of the snake as a whiplash unbraiding. Um, so the friendship, um, it means friendship on the one hand, cordiality, or on the other hand, it's a bit of a pun on, on the, the look of a snake. The final stanza of the poem begins with this discourse marker, but, which shifts the tone of the poem to something far more threatening and ominous. There's a sense of anxiety. This has been lurking beneath the surface of the poem and it becomes far more explicit in this final stanza. The sense of friendship, amity, cordiality is definitely reduced as a sense of disturbance um, is portrayed. The sense of menace that the snake has can be seen in the phrase that it, it creates a tighter breathing, suggesting something um, horrifying, a, a, a kind of a chilling constriction, um, a fear that seeing the snake or, or meeting the fellow has created. And this line, and zero at the bone, is very enigmatic. What does it mean? Well, we can't fully be sure, but zero suggests some sort of emptiness, um, and, and at the bone suggests some sort of deep disturbance within us, suggesting that seeing nature gives us a feeling of, of perhaps smallness, emptiness. Um, certainly we know that Dickinson, of, or Dickinson speaks in her poem, often feels diminished. Um, she describes herself as a term in between in her poem, Behind Me Dips Eternity, suggesting that she feels reduced um, in the face of such grand, grandness within uh, nature. I think this sense of restriction that we get with a tighter breathing can be seen in Dickinson's very clever use of sound effects and also very clever use of rhyme. We have assonance, which means repetition of vowel sounds, with all these very closed O sounds. Um, but never met this fellow, attended or alone, um, zero at the bone. These very closed, tight O sounds, um, creating a sense of restriction and constriction. And we also have exact full rhyme with alone and bone. And this, again, um, suggests something conclusive, that the nature of the snake will always have this terrifying effect. Um, and this, this deep disturbance, I think, is, is very cleverly mirrored in Dickinson's use of assonance and exact rhyme. We still have the feminine endings. Um, here there should be a final strong beat to the I am, and again in the third line, um, 
So we can still say the similar things about the unease that the feminine en endings create. Some critics see the snake in this poem as phallic and suggest that the poem could also be about Dickinson's fear and mixed feelings of love. Um, certainly the snake um, described as a shaft and maybe the transport of cordiality suggests some sort of sexual emotion or the tighter breathing again suggests um, some sort of um, romantic liaison. Um, and so this poem suggests the fear of that, the anxiety around it, but also that it is quite alluring at the same time, a bit like the snake it is quite wondrous for Dickinson. And so the ambiguity of this poem reflects her, her mixed feelings um, about love and sex. Certainly in a poem of hers in Winter in My Room, which is about a um, sexual experience or she's imagining some sort of experience the poem uses similar language instead of a snake we have a worm and it also uses the word cordiality so by putting this poem within the context of Dickinson's wider collection remember that's context A04 we could suggest this alternative interpretation so I hope this podcast has helped you get to grips with this poem and good luck in your revision <laughs>